Let us therefore animate and encourage each other and show the whole world that a free man contending for liberty on his own ground is superior to any slavish mercenary on earth. In world history, there are several pivotal moments that forever impacted the generations that followed. The fall of Rome, the discovery of the new world, the second world war. There is a common thread in each of these moments. The nature of the world before the event was never again the same because of the event. We would be remiss if we did not also include the American Revolution in that list of pivotal historical moments. Historians remember this world-shaking event from the late 18th century by many names, but most appropriately, this was the American War for Independence. The cause of freedom was at the center of this world battle, the belief that freedom from tyranny is a cause worth living and worth dying for. The American War for Independence appears to come straight out of the epic stories of old. It was a classic underdog story, the brash, untrained, and undisciplined colonists on their home turf against the most powerful and largest military force in the world, the British Empire. Although fought entirely on the American continent, this war was something of a world war. Other world superpowers wanted to be part of the American struggle for independence against the mighty Brits. Fought over a span of eight years, the war for independence would forever change Western civilization and in fact the world. Little did the world know it, but a new global superpower was about to enter the scene and eventually lead the way to excellence on the world stage. Let's go back together and discover the true story of the American War for Independence. Let's explore the personalities, the characters, the heroes and villains of this true epic tale. And let's explore the fighting spirit and resolve of the American soldiers as they stood toe to toe against the most powerful empire in the world to risk their lives for the cause of freedom. This is the Revolutionary War. A truism throughout history is that the larger an empire becomes, the more difficult it becomes to rule. It was true in Alexander's Greece, ancient Rome, and the medieval Mongol Empire. Now, in the late 18th century, the world was carved up and largely ruled by several European empires. France controlled large portions of Africa, while Spain ruled much of the lands in Central and South America. Neither one of these dynasties compared, however, with the British Empire. Britain claimed substantial amounts of land in virtually every continent on Earth. The old saying, the sun never sets on the British Empire, was undoubtedly true in the 18th century. At this point in history, Britain had the strongest army in the world and the strongest navy. It was the unchallenged superpower on the globe. Now, one of Britain's colonies, the lands in the North American eastern coast, was beginning to get restless. The avalanche of revolution begins here, with several subsequent events to push the colonists to war. The first was the French and Indian War. Now, the French and Indian War, what does this have to do with the revolution? Well, the name is somewhat misleading. It was not a war between France and the Native Americans, nor was it certainly a war between France and the country of India in the East. This was a war between two ancient rivals, France and Britain, another chapter in their centuries-long skirmishes. Now, two important things to note about this war. The first, the war took place on the American continent, which means the majority of British soldiers who fought in this war were, in fact, American. This is the first real military conflict for a young man who would turn the tide of Western history, 22-year-old George Washington, who served as an English commander in the war. Washington was one of many Englishmen who would eventually rebel against their imperial overlords and do battle for their independence. The second, the war's outcome. Britain won the French and Indian War, thus gaining considerable land from France as well as Spain, and largely clearing the North American continent of any worldwide contenders, at least in the East. But in order to finance the war, the Brits borrowed considerable amounts of money and needed a fix to get out of debt. Their solution? Tax the colonists, many of whom had just helped Britain rid the continent of those pesky French. As one can imagine, this did not please the colonists in America, who wanted to be treated with the same respect as those back in England. 
Well, anger began to rumble among the colonists. Now, remember, these men considered themselves Englishmen, and so they wanted fair and equal treatment with those in England and the rest of the empire as well. It's vital to remember in the story of the revolution, the colonists were angry and they had every right to be. This was not a wild rebellion against a ruling power. It was simply men who felt they were equal in the colonies to those back in England, acting out of a just desire for fair treatment. By the beginning of the 1770s, the anger in the colonies was reaching fever pitch. Now we come to a pivotal day in American history, and that is March the 5th, 1770 in Boston, Massachusetts. Now during this time, there were only 1,600 colonists living in the city, occupied by roughly 2,000 British soldiers. Already the Crown was fearing an uprising. Now several days before March 5th, there were multiple skirmishes between colonial patriots and British soldiers, including one which resulted in the death of an 11-year-old colonial boy. Finally, on March 5th, several angry colonists approached the King's Custom House and began heckling the lone British guard, Private Hugh White. When he began fighting back, striking a colonist with the backside of his bayonet, this angered the colonists even more and they began throwing snowballs at Private White as tension began growing. White called for help and several soldiers arrived on the scene with their muskets drawn. Now, legend has it that one of the soldiers reportedly heard the word fire and thinking it was a command, he opened fire on the weaponless colonists. The rest of the soldiers then joined, killing five colonists, including the African-American Crispus Attucks. Six other colonists were wounded in an event that would go down in history as the Boston Massacre. John Adams would say of the massacre years later this, on that night, the formation of American independence was laid. Not the Battle of Lexington or Bunker Hill, not the surrender of Burgoyne or Cornwallis, were more important events in American history than the Battle of King Street on March the 5th, 1770, of course referring to the Boston Massacre. Hey, uh, what you reading? Um, uh, well, I got off Facebook again and um, I can't stand Twitter. I can't even get on it, Who honestly. Uh, yeah, really. Um, so I thought, you know, maybe if I went a little old school, I'd get some old school journalism, you know, something really yeah. hard, hard hitting. hitting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, are you getting it? I mean... Can I, can I take a look at least? Sure, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I can already tell from the headlines this, this just isn't going to cut it, you know? It's awful. It's a shame, I know. You know, if I was doing the news, I'd do it a little bit different from what everyone else is doing. Yeah, me too. DOJ quietly ended Trump's policy oh, union of withholding K federal U, funding to Governor Eric Schmidt's city. Are you looking for a fun, family Christian TV show? Well, I can help. Hi, my name is Tim Bassanio, and I have a new show out there that has got your name all over it. It is called Good Guys Doing Good. We go all over the country showcasing men that are doing good in their communities in fun and unique ways. The men that we highlight on this show are called according to his purpose. We laugh, we cry, we have fun serving alongside these great men. Don't miss this show. Go to FISM.TV slash good guys and learn all about the show. Go to FISM.TV slash good guys. Now it was becoming increasingly clear. The colonists would have no fair treatment under the rule of the crown. Their only chance was to govern themselves, and the only way that would happen is if they broke free from British rule. Of course, there was no way to freedom without war on the empire. And that is exactly what happened. The men who would become known as the Founding Fathers of America met for the first time in 1774 in the city of Philadelphia. Their agenda was to voice their anger over the actions of the British crown and develop a plan of action. Included in this first ever meeting of the Continental Congress was George Washington, Samuel Adams, and Patrick Henry. 
The Congress declared that every colonial citizen had unalienable rights, including the right to property, liberty, and life. If the empire was to infringe on those rights, the colonies had to fight for them. The Congress planned a second meeting in the spring of 1775 to further their plans, but before that happened, war broke out. In April of 1775, British troops marched towards Concord, Massachusetts near Boston to pillage a colonial armory before a rebellion could begin. When they arrived at Lexington, the several hundred strong redcoats met a group of Minutemen about 70 strong. A shot rang out and the battle began. To this day, no one knows for sure which side fired the first bullet, a gunshot that would become known as the shot heard round the world. Eight American colonists were killed in the skirmish and several more were wounded, where only one redcoat was wounded. The British Army moved ahead to Lexington where they met another colonial resistance. This time, the Americans drew the most blood, killing three redcoats and losing only two of their own. The Revolutionary War was underway. Only a month later, the Continental Congress met for a second time. Their plans no doubt heavily changed from what they'd originally expected when they last met back in 1774. The Congress, with some famous additions such as Thomas Jefferson and local Philadelphian Benjamin Franklin, formally commissioned the creation of a Continental Army to lead the resistance. The 43-year-old George Washington, with his experience and expertise from the Franco-Indian War, was elected as the Commander-in-Chief. In the beginning of the war, the Continental Army struggled severely against the British. Now, remember, Though the patriotic zeal and courage was high among the colonists, their fighting ability was usually no match for the Brits. The Royal Army was the most disciplined, well-funded, and well-trained in the world. In the beginning, perhaps the only real reason the colonists were able to survive was their distinct home field advantage. The Continental Army relied on a guerrilla style of warfare, hiding in forests and ambushing the Redcoats when they had the chance. Compare that to the aristocratic noble style of the British in their bright red uniforms marching like a wave and standing in formation. Their grandeur was majestic and fell in line with a long history of military chivalry going back to the Middle Ages, but it did not prove useful in crushing the rebellion. In fact, in some cases, it actually gave the Americans wearing dark or dull colored jackets that could provide camouflage in the forests the advantage they needed to survive battles where they were severely outnumbered or would have been crushed in head-to-head -head combat. Washington's first major victory against the British was the capture of New York in March of 1776. After the country made an official declaration of independence in the summer of 1776, Washington won another decisive victory on Christmas night in that same year when he led the Continental Army across the frigid Delaware River in the dead of night and ambushed the Hessian Army that was in the service of Great Britain, several miles north of Philadelphia. Many of them were drunk and tired from the celebration of Christmas the day before, and this gave the Americans a distinct advantage, an advantage which led them to victory. But in 1777, the Brits gained a vital upper hand in the fight, even as the Americans were building momentum. In the fall of 1777, the British captured the all-important city of Philadelphia. Now, remember, this is early modern warfare, where fighting styles and tactics were not unlike those used in ancient and medieval times. In this type of archaic warfare, capital cities and major cities were not only hubs of populations, they were the lifeblood of the nation. They housed the leaders, they were often where commanders' headquarters were stationed, and they represented the entire nation in one place. In short, you lose your capital city, you likely lose your nation and your war. Now, Philadelphia was this type of city. Strategically located on the intersection of the Delaware and Schuylkill Rivers, only miles off the Atlantic coast, this was one of those lifeblood cities for the Continental Army. It is clear it was imperative for the revolutionaries to gain control of Philadelphia again. So General Washington led his army to the hill country of Valley Forge, about 20 miles west of Philadelphia, up the Schuylkill River, to camp out for the winter of 1777 and 1778. Though there was not a single battle fought at Valley Forge, the American encampment there was the first turning point in the tide of the war. Oh, hey there. Are you tired of the same old news that you've been reading just constantly over and over and over the same things and the same messages? Well, 
Here at FISM, we understand that news needs to be done a little bit differently. And that's why I'm part of the program, FISM News. But what does it mean to do news differently? Well, follow me in, I can show you. See, many news stations pretend to be uninfluenced or unbiased while pushing some kind of secret agenda. But we're upfront about who we are. We're Christian, we're conservative, and we give you news that you can trust and depend on. And obviously it takes more than just me to actually bring you the news. We have a dedicated and passionate team, thank you so much, that aims to bring you the facts and data that you need from the biblical and conservative perspective that we strive towards. Follow us on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at FISM News. Be sure to check out our website at FISM.TV slash news. Hey there, it's Samuel Case from FISM News. If you're enjoying this feature length A Moment in History show, and of course you are, I mean, it's awesome, you can go on to FISM.TV slash news to find the full archive of all our A Moment in History minis. It's right on the homepage for FISM News. You'll be able to go through a back catalog, explore through the ages from ancient history up through the medieval period, all the way to the modern day with some fun, uh, interesting stories in between that you might not have heard in your history class while you were in high school. You'll want to check it out on FISM.TV slash news. Expand that knowledge, impress your friends. Now back to the show. We are here in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, and today we're going to explore a military campaign that turned the tide of the Revolutionary War in favor of the Americans. And we're gonna see how it helped the American army win their freedom against the British. It feels very heroic here, standing on the front porch of what was Washington's headquarters, looking out and thinking, boy, what would the battle have looked like here? But remember, there was no battle at Valley Forge. In fact, the only battle that was fought here at Valley Forge happened before the campaign began. The Americans arrived here at their camp for the winter of 1777 to 1778 in December. In September of that year, the Brits had raided the forgery in downtown Valley Forge, which by the way is where it gets its name, Valley Forge. They had raided that forgery, attacked it, taken some weapons and burned it down. That was the only fighting that ever happened here during the American Revolution. So Valley Forge was really important because this was the opportunity for the Americans to take back the city of Philadelphia. And by the way, Philadelphia was a very, very strategic city at this point in the war. It was one of the biggest cities in the colonies. And so the colonials could not afford to lose Philadelphia. Now let's also talk for a second about the commander in chief, George Washington. General Washington was under tight scrutiny at this point from the men in the Continental Congress. He had had some failures in the previous years in certain battles, and this campaign at Valley Forge was really going to be the test of whether George Washington was going to be able to continue to lead the Americans, and especially lead them to victory. You can see behind me, these are cabins that would have looked like the cabins that the American soldiers built while they were here. These are not the original cabins, but rather these are what they probably would have looked like. Each of the cabins was roughly 14 by 16 feet, 14 feet wide by 16 feet long. And there were about 2,000 or so cabins at the Valley Forge encampment during this time. Now, there were roughly 12,000 American soldiers here in addition to 400 or so women and children. So that's a lot of people. You think if you do the math right, that's around five to 10 people per cabin. Not great living quarters here for sure. There was great resilience among these American soldiers though, and they faced a lot. They faced a very, very harsh winter. Not the romanticized winter that we often think of when we think of Valley Forge. This would have been like any other winter that they would have faced. But they faced cold weather, certainly. They faced a lack of supplies, a lack of food, wild animals, and most importantly, they faced disease. Around 2,000 American soldiers died from various diseases, such as typhoid or influenza, but they stood their ground, they stood strong, and that's part of the importance and significance here at Valley Forge. The campaign at Valley Forge is often called the birth of the true American army. And this is where the Continental Army, which previously was a ragtag kind of bunch of just farmers and other people who came together, it became a premier fighting force. And the reason for that was General Washington's secret weapon, Baron von Steuben. 
Von Steuben was a fierce Prussian military officer, and Washington brought him on to train his ragtag soldiers into a premier fighting force that would challenge the Brits. Some people, when they study Valley Forge, you know, they ask the question, why was Valley Forge significant if there was no battle fought here? Well, the reason for the significance is actually twofold. Number one, it solidified the American resolve and confidence in George Washington, who, by the way, kept his job. He was not fired, he was not relieved of his duties, but he was able to remain as the commander in chief of the army and would eventually become the first president of the United States. Number two, it turned the American army into a fierce fighting force. And sure enough, at the Battle of Monmouth in June of 1778, the first battle after the Americans left Valley Forge, the Americans defeated the British and took back Philadelphia. Now that's kind of an interesting story too. There was no battle over Philadelphia. The Brits just up and left. They just kind of got tired of Philadelphia. Maybe they didn't want to stay there, but they left and the Americans were able to regain Philadelphia as well. And in 1783, the Americans finally defeated the British Army, winning their independence and beginning the nation that we call home today, the United States of America. Almost immediately after the first American victory since its rebirth at Valley Forge, the second turning point in the war came in the form of a formidable ally for the United States. Now, since the early years of the war, Britain's chief nemesis from Europe, France, who we saw earlier, had been supplying the United States with aid. But in June of 1778, France openly joined the American cause and declared war on Great Britain in the American fight for independence. The assistance from a world superpower leveled the playing field for the Americans. And from 1778 to 1781, the Americans slowly gained ground on the British. Now, a combination of several things began to make the outcome of the war inevitable. First, Britain was attempting to fund and fight a war on the opposite side of the world from its capital. With an ocean in between the capital and the colonies, generating support, i.e. manpower, supplies, and morale, was becoming increasingly difficult. The Americans, on the other hand, were fighting on their home turf, as we've already said, where they knew the terrain and they could easily be resupplied with weapons and manpower. Second, Britain was now fighting not only against the Americans, but also against an army in France that was nearly as strong as Britain. It was not just France that supported the American cause, by the way. Other European superpowers certainly contributed in lesser ways to the American cause because it meant bringing Britain's world domination down, which the other European superpowers would have loved. Now, third and perhaps most telling, the Americans had so much more to gain from victory than did the British. These men were, after all, fighting for the freedom to live their lives according to the God-ordained ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In 1779 and 1780, the British slowly lost the tight control they once had on the colonies. Now, it is at this point in the story that we must look at the treachery of the American betrayer, Benedict Arnold. His treachery backfired, by the way, and it lit a fire in the Americans that helped push them to victory. Benedict Arnold's story arc almost seems like it's something out of a movie. Before he would become a villain, he was an American hero. He'd suffered a leg wound back in a battle in Canada in 1775, but returned to lead the Americans to a crucial success in the Battle of Lake Champlain. Arnold played a vital role in the Battle of Bemis Heights in 1777, in which he bypassed orders from his superiors to gain an upper hand on the British. The plan worked, and this victory contributed greatly to the French joining the American cause later in the war. But here is where the story of Benedict Arnold began to change. After re-injuring his leg, he was appointed military governor over the crucial American city of, you guessed it, Philadelphia. Sources say he lived like a king, but could not pay for it. This debt, coupled with the fact that Arnold held a fierce grudge against the American military, particularly General Washington, for refusing to give him the promotion he felt he deserved, led him to commit treason. While serving as governor, he began conspiring with British Major John Andre to purposefully deliver the established American base at West Point, New York, to the British. His reward would be both monetary, to pay his many debts, and a high position in the British military. Before the plan could come to fruition, though, the Continental Army captured Andre. Arnold then abandoned his post in Philadelphia and escaped to a British encampment before he, too, would be captured. As it turns out, Arnold's treason backfired, it lit a fire in the belly of the patriotic cause for the colonists. These Americans, who were enraged upon hearing news of the devilish governor of Philadelphia who betrayed his country. 
And this is perhaps the fourth reason why the Americans were able to gain the upper hand in the war. Even as their country was in its infant years, they loved it. They loved their country. Their patriotic zeal was enough to drive their nemesis out. And this, of course, brings our story up to the pivotal year of 1781, where in the city of Yorktown, Virginia, a combined American and French force led by General Washington defeated the British army of Lord Charles Cornwallis and forced his surrender. Now, historians mark this as the beginning of the end for the British. After this pivotal surrender, British troops began retreating out of American cities in great numbers, and this set the stage for the Treaty of Paris in 1783. American ambassadors met with British leaders in a hotel in Paris on September 4th. Among those Americans were founding fathers Benjamin Franklin, the American ambassador to France, and future American president John Adams. The American ambassadors made sure to stay firm on the terms of surrender, including the all-important statement of American independence that Great Britain would formally recognize the United States of America as a sovereign nation. The Treaty of Paris was signed, officially ending the Revolutionary War and formally granting the United States freedom from Great Britain. While General Washington would step in as the first president of the United States, voted in with his vice president, John Adams, in 1789. Revisionist historians would argue that the United States was nothing more than a cesspool of slavery, racism, and not founded in any way on biblical principles or a Christian worldview. But nothing could be further from the truth. The birth of the United States is the birth of a nation unprecedented in world history. The Founding Fathers intended that this nation be a place where anyone, no matter their background, could enjoy a life of freedom and could prosper so long as they were willing to work hard enough for it. Now, as any nation in world history, the United States has not been perfect. But in the last 250 years, the nation has exceeded its purpose as a land of opportunity where ordinary men and women could freely pursue the ideals of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Most of all, the nation has only prospered when as was the case for the Kingdom of Israel way back in the Old Testament, the values and laws of Almighty God were the supreme authority in the land. Conversely, when the laws of God are slain in the street, the innocent are abandoned and evil is called good and good is called evil, the nation will be punished. This should not surprise us. May this nation return to the ideals on which it was founded coming out of the victory in the revolution, heeding the words of our first president who said this, the propitious smiles of heaven, in other words, of Almighty God, can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. Thank you so much for joining me, as always, for a moment in history.